As you've no doubt already heard, free speech absolutist Elon Musk, the real life Iron Man, is purchasing $44 billion worth of bird sight. And a lot of folks in the USA where I come from are super stoked about this. And it should come as no surprise, free speech as a concept is pretty culturally significant in the USA. My fellow Americans are fond of the idea that we are free to speak our minds. And I think most folks in Western nations like the USA firmly believe that we do have freedom of speech. After all, here I am making this video right now talking to you on the internet rather freely, are I not? Well, that's what we're going to explore in today's video. But before we can talk about freedom of speech, we got to talk about freedom itself, because the word freedom, it's, it's kind of loaded. Freedom is defined to me by relationships that we have with our fellow human beings in human society. I mean, if you lived in complete isolation, cut off from the rest of society, the word freedom would kind of lose meaning, wouldn't it? I mean, sure, there'd be no cops, no bosses, no parents, nobody to force you to do or not do anything, but you also wouldn't really be free from anything since there'd be nobody to limit your freedom. You get what I'm saying? Freedom is defined by objective social relations. And those relationships affect what we are and are not able to do. And usually when we think of freedom in capitalist society, we think of negative freedom. That is to say, freedom from other people stopping you from doing what you want to do. So you might think that living in complete isolation would mean you have complete freedom. And I guess you would have complete negative freedom since there's really nobody to stop you from doing anything, but that doesn't mean you can really have the freedom to do anything you want to do. For instance, you could not play a game of Smash Bros with a friend or go to Taco Bell and buy a Volcano Taco Cravings box. And that's because those kind of things are positive freedoms. Positive freedoms, like negative freedoms, come from external relationships with human society. But whereas negative freedoms deal with people stopping you from doing stuff, positive freedoms deal with other people empowering you to do the things that you want to do. In order to have the positive freedom to eat a burger at a restaurant, the restaurant must exist to begin with, and you have to have some means of obtaining the burger from the people who work at that restaurant. In order to be truly free to play patty cakes, my favorite game, in order to have that positive freedom, you have to have a co-patty caker. Take away your patty cake partner and you lose the positive freedom to patty your cakes. Take a look at the Constitution of the United States of America, the most important document of freedom in the history of freedom, according to most freedom-loving Americans anyway. It's all about and only about negative freedoms, and it offers practically nothing in the way of positive freedoms. I mean, it does start off promising life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but it does nothing to actually guarantee those rights in the real world. There's no provision for ensuring that you can actually have freedom or even life in the Constitution. The freedoms that are offered by the Constitution are simply illusionary. There's no guarantee that you're gonna be able to get food, clean water, shelter, clothing, or any of that other stuff that you need to really be alive. You know, positive freedoms. So as much as we Americans love to brag about our freedoms, in truth, the vast majority of us only have the illusion of freedom in most ways that matter. I mean, in our capitalist society, positive freedom is pretty much tied directly to wealth. The more money you have, the more positive freedom you can buy. You might have the negative freedom to own a gun, for instance. The government won't stop you. But unless you have the money to buy a gun, you won't be practicing that freedom in any real meaningful way. In other words, most Americans who live in poverty only have an illusion of freedom to own a firearm, especially with the soaring cost of guns and ammo these days. So you see, our freedoms are by and large merely illusionary. In order to be truly free in the real world, our freedoms must be synthesized. That means we have to have both the negative freedom, i.e. nobody will stop us from doing shit, but we also have to have the positive freedom i.e. we have to have all the shit we need to do shit. Negative plus positive, that's synthesis. Get it? Synthesized freedom. Like, right now, I have the negative freedom to own a luxury yacht. I could own a luxury yacht in theory, nobody would stop me, I guess, but that freedom is not synthesized because I can't afford to buy a luxury yacht in practice. So illusionary freedom 
can be thought of as freedom in theory, whereas synthesized freedom is freedom we have in practice, in the real world. Now, I'm not gonna say that everyone should have the synthesized freedom to own a luxury yacht. In fact, that would probably suck a lot and be bad for the environment. But there are some freedoms that I do believe ought to be synthesized, and one of those freedoms is freedom of speech. And to me, it doesn't matter if you have the illusion of freedom of speech or merely the negative freedom of speech. If that freedom is not synthesized, it's not really freedom at all, as far as I'm concerned. It's just an illusion of freedom. So yeah, sure, the government ain't gonna stop you from speaking, but does that really mean you have a voice? In other words, is your freedom of speech synthesized? In practical reality, synthesizing freedom of speech means working towards everyone having a voice. We all deserve to be heard and understood by our neighbors and within our community as much as possible. And I know what you're probably thinking, we can't all have equal voices in society. That's true. But that is an ideal that we can strive towards. It's something that we can try to develop in our society. And this brings us to another really important point about freedom. Freedom is not a yes or no proposition. It's not a binary. You can't just throw the freedom switch and have freedom. Freedom is something we must develop over time. We must synthesize freedom more and more over time to the best of our ability as a society. This is something that the ideology of freedom that we have in the USA really gets wrong in my opinion. We are brought up to believe that we have the right to freedom of speech, as if it's already a done deal, as if it's something that's either on or off. Some countries have freedom and others don't have freedom according to this USA ideology of freedom. And I'm sorry, but that's just not how it really works. In reality, some people have a lot more freedom of speech than others. When it comes to negative freedom of speech, people in prison certainly don't have as much freedom as you do. And in terms of positive freedom of speech, I have a lot more freedom than most of you watching here right now do because I have this big fancy YouTube channel. But I have way less freedom of speech in a positive and negative sense than someone like Elon Musk, who has billions of dollars to amplify his voice. So to reiterate, freedom of speech and all other freedoms are not static on off binaries. Freedom is a continuity and we all move around within that continuity dynamically over time depending on fluctuating circumstances. And I'm here to say today that in the USA and most countries on earth, freedom of speech is highly unsynthesized for the vast majority of the population in most ways that matter politically. That is to say, most people on this planet right now do not have a voice and will not be heard. The poor are silenced, while a tiny minority of capitalists have monstrously powerful voices which are magnified tremendously by their enormous wealth. After all, it's been proven in study after study around the world that politicians in bourgeois democracies listen to the wealthy far more than they listen to the poor in making policy decisions. You merely have the illusion of free speech unless you can afford to buy it. Corporations and capitalists have controlled the media for centuries now. As an example, let's take a look at this fella, William Randolph Hearst. Like Elon Musk, William Randolph Hearst was the son of a wealthy capitalist who owned a massive mining enterprise. Hearst's father was one of the original robber barons, portrayed by Major Dad on Deadwood. In addition to the mining empire, William Randolph Hearst also inherited a massive timber enterprise, as well as a newspaper, the San Francisco Examiner. Hearst went on to expand this publishing business, purchasing the failing New York Journal, and transforming the enterprise into a globe-spanning media empire through a massive injection of capital. Hearst was able to single-handedly influence large swaths of the population through what became known as yellow journalism, basically fake news and propaganda that sold a lot of paper, which incidentally was made from wood pulp that came from Hearst's timber industry, enriching him even more. And Hearst was able to build a scary amount of power and influence through his command of media. For instance, Hearst played a major role in pushing the United States of America into war against Spain by intentionally pushing the lie that Spain had sunk the United States naval vessel, the Maine, and various other fake news stories. Hearst was a quintessential media mogul who proved again and again throughout his life that positive freedom of speech is not something that is distributed with anything approaching equality in the USA or in wider capitalist society. On the contrary, positive freedom is something that is accumulated into fewer and and fewer hands over time. At the end of his career, William Randolph Hearst owned 28 major newspapers and 18 magazines, along with several radio stations, movie companies, and news services.
Today, pretty much all of the media in the USA is held by just six corporations. Of course, these days the internet is playing a huge role in influencing media production and consumption, and we are met with relatively new corporate behemoths in the realm of social media. A small handful of giant platforms like Twitter, Facebook, Google News, and YouTube have irreversibly changed the game and the market, as economist Robert Reich points out. With social media, the ordinary rules of competition don't apply. Once a platform is dominant, it becomes even more dominant. As Donald Trump discovered with his truth social fiasco, upstarts don't stand much chance. And that's just astounding when you stop to think about it. Not even Donald Trump, a former president of the United States of America who has a huge loyal following, could break into the game of social media platformsmanship. Yeah, that's a word, sure. But you know who can afford to become a huge player in the social media game? Elon fucking Musk, the richest man in the world. Because unlike Trump, he's actually rich enough to buy a controlling share of an existing major social media platform. In fact, he's doing it right now. Millions of people get their news through Twitter. Millions of people share their stories through Twitter. And right now, one person, one individual, Elon motherfucking Musk, is about to buy a $44 billion stake in Twitter. This will be the largest amount of money ever spent by a single human being on a media company in history. And it's outrageous evidence that we do not have synthesized freedom of speech in this capitalist hell world. But guys like Elon goddamn motherfucking Musk do. We live in a world where we have these amazing, mind-bogglingly powerful, complex, and innovative platforms for human communications. But we also live in a world where all that speech and communication is owned, bought and paid for by a very few wealthy plutocrats like Mark Zuckerberg, Jack Dorsey, and now Elon Musk, whose massive stake will give him veto power over a platform used by hundreds of millions of people in their daily lives. What does it mean for a single individual to control a social media platform? Well, I would argue that it's even more terrifying than a single individual owning a traditional media platform. Hearst was able to spread lies and set the agenda within his own empire, but there were rival newspapers and he didn't have the complete authority to control everything that an individual sees. But a social media platform can set the agenda for which agenda setters break through the algorithm. Facebook and Twitter actually have the ability to gatekeep which traditional media moguls have access to your brain. So there's a dialectical relationship between social media and traditional media, but I would argue that that social media actually has the upper hand as more and more people rely on social media for news and information. Now, Elon Musk is a man who is a master at manipulating narratives. He did not invent PayPal, and yet he gets the credit for PayPal. He didn't found or fund Tesla, and yet he gets the credit for Tesla. He never designed a rocket ship or a satellite in his life, and yet he gets the credit for the accomplishments of SpaceX, a company which, by the way, is largely funded by the United States federal government, even though Musk himself says he doesn't think the government should subsidize anything. Elon Musk is a manipulative liar and a very good propagandist, and he has made it very clear that he believes it's it's perfectly fine for billionaire capitalists like himself to control the planet. Having gone on the record on Twitter as saying, we will coup whoever we want, deal with it, in response to the USA's imperialism in Bolivia to obtain lithium for his shitty exploding electric cars. Or should I say his employees' shitty exploding electric cars since he didn't actually design them. Now, Musk says that he wants to own Twitter to fulfill some kind of free speech absolutist vision and remove all censorship from the platform, and former CEO of Twitter, Jack Dorsey, has signed off on this vision. But is this vision going to be fulfilled? Will we finally truly get free speech through the power of Musk? In his book, Inventing Reality, Michael Parenti blew apart the idea that capitalist entities are capable of providing free speech and free information to the public at large. The book came out in 1986, long before social media was a thing, but I really think it's worth unpacking a few of Parenti's arguments as we anticipate the prospect of a Musk-dominated Twitterverse. That was a very cursed phrase, I'm sorry for uttering it into existence. We have to understand that media platforms don't need to actively censor information to control public discourse. For many people, writes Parenti, an issue does not exist until it appears in the news media. How we view issues, indeed what we even define as an issue or event, what we see in here and what we do not see in here are greatly determined by those who control the communications world. The internet and social media were supposed to loosen this death grip on public perception by giving us the ability to produce 
produce our own content and engage with each other more directly. But if anything, it's actually made things much worse while simultaneously concealing what's going on through the murky unknowns of the algorithm. Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, they don't have to tell you shit about how those algorithms function. Various studies and reports have come out trying to document the rabbit hole effect, and we have a pretty good idea that the algorithm tends to suck people into vortexes of like-minded extremists and even push people farther and farther towards the right, but it's difficult to understand exactly what's going on behind the scenes because social media corporations are extremely secretive about how the algorithm and recommendations and timelines really function. Like, I can say anecdotally that it seems like my videos which challenge capitalism or white supremacism or otherwise challenge the status quo tend to get quashed by the algorithm, but there's really no way for me to prove this. I mean, it makes perfectly good business sense. If I were running advertisements trying to sell you razors or butt wipes or whatever, I wouldn't really want my advertisements for my capitalist enterprise running alongside some asshole talking about how capitalism sucks and capitalists are evil, but folks have been saying for years that YouTube suppresses LGBTQ plus content. It's not possible to really prove such claims or verify them in any way since the system isn't open to any kind of inspection or audit from the outside, but certainly a lot of LGBTQ plus people have come forward and said that their content seems to be suppressed by the algorithm. During the Wet'suwet'en pipeline protests, I myself saw indigenous activist social media accounts and any posts supporting them just suddenly and creepily drop from the timeline in what really seemed like a very obvious act of suppression by Twitter and Facebook, but there's no way I can prove that that's what happened. My partner Luna has this one tweet about the My Lai massacre and US war crimes in Vietnam, which has just the weirdest stuff going on with it. Like we know there were a bunch of quote tweets, but we can't actually see the quote tweets and it's just, it's creepy. And whenever she posts about USAID or the CIA, those posts also seem to get suppressed compared to her more run of the mill tweets. Now I should also mention that my Facebook page for non-compete has already been banned for violating community guidelines, but I was never told which guidelines were violated. I could really only speculate that it might be because the last post I made had the anti-fascism symbol. Maybe that's why it got banned. I don't know. I can't prove any of this algorithmic suppression stuff. That's one of the really terrible things about capitalists having complete control over our platforms with no accountability or transparency whatsoever. They can build plausible deniability right into the system. They were doing that with traditional media. The whole idea of agenda setting in the media has been denied by bourgeois media philosophers for decades, but now things are even more deniable because the algorithms are just so opaque. And this just tightens the grip that capitalists have on media and on our public discourse even more, since most of us obtain even mainstream news items through social media and platforms like Google News and YouTube. If social media were truly geared towards noble aims like freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and freedom of information, then wouldn't these platforms be transparent in how they are designed? Wouldn't we as users have a voice in how our platforms operate? Wouldn't there be systems of consensus and democracy for designing things like how the algorithm functions, who gets banned, what is and isn't acceptable behavior on these platforms, and which sources get boosted or suppressed by the algorithm. On sites like Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook, we have no input whatsoever in how these platforms engage with us or what information gets shoved in our direction. In Manufacturing Consent, Noam Chomsky describes how capitalist media must pass through several filters before being published. For instance, information has to be friendly enough to capitalist interests to not piss off corporate advertisers or it won't make it through the filter to the public. Well, with social media, this filtering process happens twice over. First, massive news corporations get to filter what does or doesn't make it to press, and then social media companies get to decide what does and doesn't get boosted by the algorithm. I mean, sure, some dissenting posts and videos will occasionally slip through the cracks, like this one, but we're talking about scale here. Even if this video that you're watching right now gets tens of thousands of views, that's but a tiny drop in the bucket, the ocean of millions and millions of views, which are given to any given corporate media video on YouTube because it's blasted out by the algorithm. And sure, a lot of us are highly skeptical of what corporate media tells us, but as Parenti says in Inventing Reality, that skepticism doesn't really matter. Even when we don't believe what the media says, we are still hearing or reading their viewpoints rather than some other. They are still setting the agenda. 
defining what it is we must believe or disbelieve, accept or reject. The media exert a subtle, persistent influence in defining the scope of respectable political discourse, channeling public attention in directions that are essentially supportive of the existing politico-economic system. This effect is even more profound on platforms like Twitter and YouTube. If you ever wanna see how this works in real time, by the way, make a brand new account and just start browsing around. You're gonna see nothing but corporate propaganda and capitalist friendly material and no dissenting voices. You will have to actively seek out challenges to capitalism and the algorithm will do everything it can to either turn you down a separate road or if you do find yourself in an anarchist or communist rabbit hole, for instance, it will wall you off from the mainstream algorithm in your own little echo chamber. And this is all a very complicated and subtle process of manipulation as Parenti wrote, in sum, the media sets the limits on public discourse and public understanding. They may not always always mold opinion, but they do not always have to. It is enough that they create opinion visibility, giving legitimacy to certain views and illegitimacy to others. This power to determine the issue agenda, the information flow, and the parameters of political debate so that it extends from the ultra right to no further than moderate center is, if not total, still totally awesome. The key words here, I think, are information flow. Capitalism has complete control over the flow of information on social media. They don't have to censor out revolutionary anti-capitalist voices like mine completely and utterly. They just have to keep the stream of free thought contained to a manageable trickle and do it in such a way that there's just enough plausible deniability to make any inquiries into the matter seem inconclusive, even paranoid in nature. They don't have to shut us up completely. They just have to turn down the volume, then act innocent whenever anyone points it out. This is how the media, including internet social media platforms, set the agenda of society, and it's how they've invaded our very consciousness in a staggeringly short amount of time, and with almost no real objection from us. We accept these manipulations and subtle forms of censorship and control because it's convenient and kind of fun and addictive. It's hard to criticize Facebook or Twitter too much when you're literally addicted to those platforms. And there are plenty of studies out there showing that these companies spend millions of dollars on research and hire some of the best experts in the industry to get you as hooked as possible on these platforms. And not only are we addicted to these platforms, but we're also being essentially brainwashed by them. See, the human mind is remarkable. For starters, your consciousness is not restricted to the confines of your own brain. Every time you write something down, you're projecting your consciousness, your mind, your experiences beyond the barriers of your individual brain. Media like the written word and digital video and social media platforms expand our consciousness and our knowledge and our understanding and provide for deeper connections with other human minds. That is to say, we can teach each other, we can brainstorm together, we can solve problems together, and the internet is a profound and marvelous extension and networking of human consciousness. Look at what we've been able to accomplish by working together and communicating online. It can't be doubted that platforms like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and even Reddit, I guess, <laughs> extend and enhance our consciousness and deeply affect our thoughts and our knowledge of this world. And think of all the things you've learned online, all the people you've met online, all the problems you've solved and lives you've touched through the internet. But have you ever thought about the ways in which your consciousness is being affected by the internet itself without your consent or even your knowledge? Have you ever thought about the fact that you don't own these external components of your own consciousness, these systems which have such profound impact on your very thoughts. You don't really have any agency over how your consciousness is being affected and manipulated by these platforms and their algorithms as we've discussed. But have you considered, I mean, really stop to think about the ways in which your own consciousness is essentially being programmed by these external algorithmic components, which are owned by corporations that do not have your best interests in mind. After all, we do implement social media platforms deeply into our psyches. I don't know about you, but literally the first thing I do every morning is grab my phone and check my notifications. And it's also the last thing I do before I go to bed at night. The average person spends about 147 minutes every single day on social media. That's almost a quarter of your waking hours. And these numbers are going up steadily over time. It's simply a fact that social media embeds itself deeply within your mind. When you see something cool out in the real world, you probably have an instinct to take a photo and throw it on Facebook or Instagram. When a funny thought occurs to you, there's a good chance you have the immediate instinct 
to fire off a tweet about it. And when you're lonely, bored, or just want someone to listen because you've had a bad day, you're probably going to a place like Facebook or Reddit or Twitter or YouTube to fill that void. And you're just not in control of these experiences you're having online or the impacts that they're having on your consciousness. The things that you do, say, and share are tightly controlled by these very powerful entities, which we call corporations. They have ultimate control over who you're communicating with, who sees your posts, and they're spending countless billions of dollars hiring some of the most brilliant people on earth to make you addicted to these platforms and to control what you see and how you feel. And in that sense, you have voluntarily given away access to your own consciousness to these corporations. Deep access, controlling access in a very real and very scary way, they are setting the agenda of your daily thoughts and emotion. That's why it's so effed up that we live in a world where one human being, one individual can take a commanding share of a social media platform. And that one person like Elon Musk can purchase leverage over a humanity spanning communication system, which is also an extension of consciousness for millions of us, one which holds the power to manipulate and control our very minds in real and meaningful ways. That one person can have direct individual control over a system like that. And the fact that we all voluntarily allow this to be possible is staggering. It's stunning to me how we all live in horror of the government censoring our free speech, but we are A-OK -okay with capitalists manipulating our minds and our speech and our media consumption so deeply with absolutely no transparency whatsoever. I mean, we don't really know how these algorithms work. I can't stress that enough, but we're ever so willing to just hand over control of these platforms, which we spend so much of our waking lives interacting with over to these capitalists with so little reservation. Now, things are not completely hopeless. There are ways out of this labyrinth of corporate mind control, manipulation, and brainwashing, but it's gonna require a lot of struggle. We're gonna have to raise a lot of awareness and work tirelessly, and we're gonna have to fight addictions, not just our own addictions, but the addictions of the people in our lives. Because right now, most people don't even know or care that they have no freedom of speech and that they're being controlled and coerced by these corporate entities. So how bad is it that Elon Musk is buying such a huge share of Twitter? To be honest, I don't think it's really gonna make that much of a difference. We already had world dominating asshole capitalists owning all of our social media to begin with. So what difference will it make that a portion of ownership is transferred to a different world dominating asshole capitalist? To me, Musk buying such a huge share of Twitter just highlights the underlying problem we've had from the beginning that we don't have any real ownership of social media and that we're being so intensely controlled and brainwashed by these platforms and that there's absolutely no accountability with these awesome, massive systems of communication. We've never had ownership or control of these hyper-dominant social media platforms, and this tiny minority of capitalist billionaires have always had control, and all of them, except maybe Tom, have been reprehensible ghouls and tyrants and how they use these platforms to control us. So no, we don't have freedom of speech. That is to say, our freedom of speech has never been synthesized. And if anything, capitalist domination of social media is actively unsynthesizing what freedom of speech we might have had while building the illusion of freedom more and more as time goes on. And there are even more terrifying things on the horizon, like Elon Musk's dabbling in neural interfaces, which could give capitalists like him even more direct control over our brains. My buddy Big Villainous over at Overthrow Media just put out a great video about that. I highly recommend you check it out. And we'll be exploring topics like these and more in future videos here on Non-Compete. So be sure to subscribe and pray to the algorithm that you might actually see future videos when they're released. And as for Elon Musk, well, I think Parenti clocked him over 35 years ago with this description. If Big Brother comes to America, he will not be a fearsome, foreboding figure with a heart-chilling, omnipresent glare as in 1984. He will come with a smile on his face, a quip on his lips, a wave to the crowd, and a press that A, dutifully reports the suppressive measures he is taking to save the nation from internal chaos and foreign threat, and B, gingerly questions whether he will be able to succeed. I'm American Johnson. This is non -Kabi. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Real quick, I want to thank everybody whose name you see on the screen right now. These are our camaraderie and Patreon supporters. We could not make this content without your support. So thank you so much. I know times are tough right now. If you do want to consider supporting us, there are links in the description. We really would appreciate it. And yeah, that's what keeps us going. Thanks for watching. What about freedom? But what does it mean?